The Desire of Ages, Chapter 71 A Servant of Servants In the upper chamber of a dwelling at Jerusalem, Christ was sitting at table with his disciples. They had gathered to celebrate the Passover. The Saviour desired to keep this feast alone with the Twelve. He knew that his hour was come. He himself was the true Paschal Lamb, and on the day the Passover was eaten, he was to be sacrificed. He was about to drink the cup of wrath. He must soon receive the final baptism of suffering. But a few quiet hours yet remained to him, and these were to be spent for the benefit of his beloved disciples. The whole life of Christ had been a life of unselfish service. Not to be ministered unto, but to minister, had been the lesson of his every act. But not yet had the disciples learned the lesson. At this last Passover supper, Jesus repeated his teaching by an illustration that impressed it forever on their minds and hearts. The interviews between Jesus and his disciples were usually seasons of calm joy, highly prized by them all. The Passover suppers had been scenes of special interest, but upon this occasion, Jesus was troubled. His heart was burdened, and a shadow rested upon his countenance. As he met the disciples in the upper chamber, they perceived that something weighed heavily upon his mind, and although they knew not its cause, they sympathized with his grief. As they were gathered about the table, he said in tones of touching sadness, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Christ knew that the time had come for him to depart out of the world and go to his Father. And having loved his own that were in the world, he loved them unto the end. He was now in the shadow of the cross, and the pain was torturing his heart. He knew that he would be deserted in the hour of his betrayal. He knew that by the most humiliating process to which criminals were subjected, he would be put to death. He knew the ingratitude and cruelty of those he had come to save. He knew how great the sacrifice that he must make, and for how many it would be in vain. Knowing all that was before him, he might naturally have been overwhelmed with the thought of his own humiliation and suffering. But he looked upon the twelve who had been with him as his own, and who, after his shame and sorrow and painful usage were over, would be left to struggle in the world. His thoughts of what he himself must suffer were ever connected with his disciples. He did not think of himself. His care for them was uppermost in his mind. On this last evening with his disciples, Jesus had much to tell them. If they had been prepared to receive what he longed to impart, they would have been saved from heartbreaking anguish, from disappointment and unbelief. But Jesus saw that they could not bear what he had to say. As he looked into their faces, the words of warning and comfort were stayed upon his lips. Moments passed in silence. Jesus appeared to be waiting. 
The disciples were ill at ease. The sympathy and tenderness awakened by Christ's grief seemed to have passed away. His sorrowful words pointing to his own suffering had made little impression. The glances they cast upon each other told of jealousy and contention. There was a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. This contention, carried on in the presence of Christ, grieved and wounded him. The disciples clung to their favorite idea that Christ would assert his power and take his position on the throne of David. And in heart, each still longed for the highest place in the kingdom. They had placed their own estimate upon themselves and upon one another. And instead of regarding their brethren as more worthy, they had placed themselves first. The request of James and John to sit on the right and left of Christ's throne had excited the indignation of the others. That the two brothers should presume to ask for the highest position so stirred the ten that alienation threatened. They felt that they were misjudged, that their fidelity and talents were not appreciated. Judas was the most severe upon James and John. When the disciples entered the supper room, their hearts were full of resentful feelings. Judas pressed next to Christ on the left side. John was on the right. If there was a highest place, Judas was determined to have it. And that place was thought to be next to Christ. And Judas was a traitor. Another cause of dissension had arisen. At a feast, it was customary for a servant to wash the feet of the guests, and on this occasion, preparation had been made for the service. The pitcher, the basin, and the towel were there, in readiness for the feet washing. But no servant was present. And it was the disciples' part to perform it. But each of the disciples yielding to wounded pride determined not to act the part of a servant. All manifested a historical unconcern, seeming unconscious that there was anything for them to do. By their silence, they refused to humble themselves. How was Christ to bring these poor souls where Satan would not gain over them a decided victory? How could he show that a mere profession of discipleship did not make them disciples or ensure them a place in his kingdom? How could he show that it is loving service, true humility, which constitutes real greatness? How was he to kindle love in their hearts and enable them to comprehend what he longed to tell them. The disciples made no move towards serving one another. Jesus waited for a time to see what they would do. Then he, the divine teacher, rose from the table. Laying aside the outer garment that would have impeded his movements, he took a towel and girded himself. With surprised, interest, the disciples looked on and in silence waited to see what was to follow. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. This action opened the eyes of the disciples. Bitter shame and humiliation filled their hearts. They understood the unspoken rebuke and saw themselves in altogether a new light. So Christ expressed his love for his disciples. Their selfish spirit filled him with sorrow, but he entered into no controversy with them regarding their difficulty. Instead, he gave them an example they would never forget. His love for them was not easily disturbed or quenched. He knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he came from God and went to God. 
He had a full consciousness of his divinity, but he had laid aside his royal crown and kingly robes and had taken the form of a servant. One of the last acts of his life on earth was to gird himself as a servant and perform a servant's part. Before the Passover, Judas had met a second time with the priests and scribes and had closed the contract to deliver Jesus into their hands. Yet, he afterward mingled with the disciples as though innocent of any wrong and interested in the work of preparing for the feast. The disciples knew nothing of the purpose of Judas. Jesus alone could read his secret. Yet, he did not expose him. Jesus hungered for his soul. He felt for him such a burden as for Jerusalem when he wept over the doomed city. His heart was crying, How can I give thee up? The constraining power of that love was felt by Judas when the Savior's hands were bathing those soiled feet and wiping them with the towel. The heart of Judas thrilled through and through with the impulse then and there to confess his sin. But he would not humble himself. He hardened his heart against repentance and the old impulses for the moment put aside again controlled him. Judas was now offended at Christ's act in washing the feet of his disciples. If Jesus could so humble himself, he thought, he could not be Israel's king. All hope of worldly honor in a temporal kingdom was destroyed. Judas was satisfied that there was nothing to be gained by following Christ. After seeing him degrade himself, as he thought, he was confirmed in his purpose to disown him and confess himself deceived. He was possessed by a demon, and he resolved to complete the work he had agreed to do in betraying his Lord. Judas, in choosing his position at table, had tried to place himself first, and Christ, as a servant, served him first. John, toward whom Judas had felt so much bitterness, was left till the last. But John did not take this as a rebuke or slight. As the disciples watched Christ's action, they were greatly moved. When Peter's turn came, he exclaimed with astonishment, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Christ's condescension broke his heart. He was filled with shame to think that one of the disciples was not performing this service. What I do, Christ said, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter could not bear to see his Lord, whom he believed to be the Son of God, acting the part of a servant. His whole soul rose up against this humiliation. He did not realize that for this Christ came into the world. With great emphasis he exclaimed, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Solemnly Christ said to Peter, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. The service which Peter refused was the type of a higher cleansing. Christ had come to wash the heart from the stain of sin. In refusing to allow Christ to wash his feet, Peter was refusing the higher cleansing included in the lower. He was really rejecting his Lord. It is not humiliating to the Master to allow him to work for our purification. The truest humility is to receive with a thankful heart any provision made in our behalf and with earnestness do service for Christ. At the words, 
If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Peter surrendered his pride and self-will. He could not endure the thought of separation from Christ. That would have been death to him. Not my feet only, he said, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. These words mean more than bodily cleanliness. Christ is still speaking of the higher cleansing as illustrated by the lower. He who came from the bath was clean, but the sandaled feet soon became dusty and again needed to be washed. So Peter and his brethren had been washed in the great fountain open for sin and uncleanness. Christ acknowledged them as his but temptation had led them into evil, and they still needed his cleansing grace. When Jesus girded himself with a towel to wash the dust from their feet, he desired by that very act to wash the alienation, jealousy, and pride from their hearts. This was of far more consequence than the washing of their dusty feet. With the spirit they then had, not one of them was prepared for communion with Christ. Until brought into a state of humility and love, they were not prepared to partake of the Paschal Supper or to share in the memorial service which Christ was about to institute. Their hearts must be cleansed. Pride and self-seeking create dissension and hatred. But all this Jesus washed away in washing their feet. A change of feeling was brought about. Looking upon them, Jesus could say, Ye are clean. Now there was union of heart, love for one another. They had become humble and teachable. Except Judas. Each was ready to concede to another the highest place. Now with subdued and grateful hearts, they could receive Christ's words. Like Peter and his brethren, we too have been washed in the blood of Christ. Yet, often through contact with evil, the heart's purity is soiled. We must come to Christ for his cleansing grace. Peter shrank from bringing his soiled feet in contact with the hands of his Lord and Master. But how often we bring our sinful, polluted hearts in contact with the heart of Christ. How grievous to him is our evil temper, our vanity and pride. Yet, all our infirmity and defilement we must bring to him. He alone can wash us clean. We are not prepared for communion with him unless cleansed by his efficacy. Jesus said to the disciples, Ye are clean, but not all. He had washed the feet of Judas, but the heart had not been yielded to him. It was not purified. Judas had not submitted himself to Christ. After Christ had washed the disciples' feet and had taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Christ would have his disciples understand that although he had washed their feet, this did not in the least detract from his dignity. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. And being so infinitely superior, 
He imparted grace and significance to the service. No one was so exalted as Christ, and yet he stooped to the humblest duty that his people might not be misled by the selfishness which dwells in the natural heart and which strengthens by self-serving. Christ himself set the example of humility. He would not leave this great subject in man's charge. Of so much consequence did he regard it that he himself, one equal with God, acted as servant to his disciples. While they were contending for the highest place, he to whom every knee shall bow, he whom the angels of glory counted honor to serve, bowed down to wash the feet of those who called him Lord. He washed the feet of his betrayer. In his life and lessons, Christ has given a perfect exemplification of the unselfish ministry which has its origin in God. God does not live for himself. By creating the world and by upholding all things, he is constantly ministering for others. He maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. This ideal of ministry God has committed to his Son. Jesus was given to stand at the head of humanity, that by his example he might teach what it means to minister. His whole life was under a law of service. He served all, ministered, to all. Thus he lived the law of God and by his example showed how we are to obey it. Again and again Jesus had tried to establish this principle among his disciples. When James and John made their request for preeminence, he had said, Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. In my kingdom, the principle of preference and supremacy has no place. The only greatness is the greatness of humility. The only distinction is found in devotion to the service of others. Now, having washed the disciples' feet, he said, I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. In these words, Christ was not merely enjoining the practice of hospitality. More was meant than the washing of the feet of guests to remove the dust of travel. Christ was here instituting a religious service. By the act of our Lord, this humiliating ceremony was made a consecrated ordinance. It was to be observed by the disciples that they might ever keep in mind his lessons of humility and service. This ordinance is Christ's appointed preparation for the sacramental service. While pride, variance and strife for supremacy are cherished, the heart cannot enter into fellowship with Christ. We are not prepared to receive the communion of his body and his blood. Therefore it was that Jesus appointed the memorial of his humiliation to be first observed. As they come to this ordinance, the children of God should bring to remembrance the words of the Lord of life and glory. Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent 
greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. There is in man a disposition to esteem himself more highly than his brother, to work for self, to seek the highest place, and often this results in evil surmisings and bitterness of spirit. The ordinance preceding the Lord's Supper is to clear away these misunderstandings, to bring man out of his selfishness, down from his stilts of self-exaltation, to the humility of heart that will lead him to serve his brother. The holy watcher from heaven is present at this season to make it one of soul searching, of conviction of sin, and of the blessed assurance of sins forgiven. Christ in the fullness of his grace is there to change the current of the thoughts that have been running in selfish channels. The Holy Spirit quickens the sensibilities of those who follow the example of their Lord. As the Savior's humiliation for us is remembered, thought links with thought. A chain of memories is called up, memories of God's great goodness and of the favor and tenderness of earthly friends. Blessings forgotten, mercies abused, kindness is slighted, are called to mind. Roots of bitterness that have crowded out the precious plant of love are made manifest. Defects of character, neglect of duties, ingratitude to God, coldness toward our brethren are called to remembrance. Sin is seen in the light in which God views it. Our thoughts are not thoughts of self-complacency, but of severe self-censure and humiliation. The mind is energized to break down every barrier that has caused alienation. Evil thinking and evil speaking are put away. Sins are confessed. They are forgiven. The subduing grace of Christ comes into the soul and the love of Christ draws hearts together in a blessed unity. As the lesson of the preparatory service is thus learned, the desire is kindled for a higher spiritual life. To this desire, the divine witness will respond. The soul will be uplifted. We can partake of the communion with a consciousness of sins forgiven. The sunshine of Christ's righteousness will fill the chambers of the mind and the soul temple. We behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. To those who receive the spirit of this service, it can never become a mere ceremonial. Its constant lesson will be, by love, serve one another. In washing the feet of his disciples, Christ gave evidence that he would do any service, however humble, that would make them heirs with him of the eternal wealth of heaven's treasure. His disciples, in performing the same rite, pledged themselves in like manner to serve their brethren. Whenever this ordinance is rightly celebrated, the children of God are brought into a holy relationship to help and bless each other. They covenant that the life shall be given to unselfish ministry. And this, not only for one another, their field of labor is as wide as their master's was. The world is full of those who need our ministry. The poor, the helpless, the ignorant are on every hand. Those who have communed with Christ in the upper chamber will go forth to minister as he did. Jesus, the served of all, came to be servant of all. And because he ministered to all, he will again be served and honored by all. And those who would partake 
of his divine attributes and share with him the joy of seeing souls redeemed must follow his example of unselfish ministry. All this was comprehended in the words of Jesus. I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. This was the intent of the service he established. And he says, if you know these things, if you know the purpose of his lessons, happy are ye if ye do them. <laughs>